Hey gang, how's it going? Uh, we're here for our second video on atomic structure. Uh, we need to talk about some electrons and what's going on with them. So get your pen and paper out and ready for some great notes. So a uh, big thing, you know, we know about electrons are attracted to the nucleus because of the positive charge of protons in the nucleus. I like this little animation. It shows how an electron is trying to find its way into a nucleus that already has one electron. So as we think of this electron is attracted to the nucleus, but it's also repelled from the other electrons. So again, this kind of push and pull uh, situation going on here, and eventually it finds its spot and it fits right in there. So as we think of the dynamics going on with the protons and the electrons, we need to think that there's both parts going on. There's, there's attraction and there's repulsion going on. Uh, when we look at the distribution of electrons, there's some terms that we need to talk about. The shell is the basic energy level for the electrons around the nucleus. And this is what uh, we talked about as uh, my freshman class, uh, as we think of the basic uh, energy level, so how far from the nucleus. And the closest it is to the nucleus is the lower energy level. Just like taking something and raising it uh, against gravity and you let it go and it's going to fall, if I raise it higher, I put more energy into it and it's stored in its position and it can fall down uh, because of that potential that it has. The same with you think about a nucleus and an electron and if I move that electron out it takes a force pulling it out like that and then it has more potential to fall back down. So the, the first closest uh, shell to the nucleus is the lowest energy level and then we go out from there like that. So that's the basic idea, but we know now that there is more to it. There are subshells, subdivisions of those shells, depending on their shapes. So I'll go into this in more detail in a little bit, but basically we have different orientations, how the electrons can be distributed around the nucleus. And some of these look very complicated, and it takes a lot of electrons and a lot of protons to force them into those strange configurations. But the big idea, you know, that first thing I showed you with the push and pull of the electron is that the electrons are attracted to the nucleus, but they're repelling from each other, and so they get stuck in these spots because there's other electrons. They can't just move wherever they want. They try moving this way and there's another electron pushing it back and so they get stuck in these little patterns and orientations around the nucleus. And those are the subshells. Uh, and then we have orbitals, which are pairings of electrons. And the electrons pair together with uh, other electrons of the opposite spin. So uh, we get a little bit into physics here, but when we talk about a spinning object, we talk about the right-hand rule. And so the, the one that's spinning there to, to the right side of the screen has an upward orientation. The other one that's spinning this way has a downward orientation. So we show them with arrows. So we'll see electrons paired up with other electrons of the same spin and that will be in the orbitals. So really, you think about orbitals as pairs, uh, pairings of electrons. So uh, as we talk about uh, our, I guess I can move myself up a little bit there, uh, number of uh, electrons in the subshells and the types of subshells. So there's four types of subshells that we know of right now. Uh, as we eventually discover more elements, there will be more uh, subshells. But each shell uh, starts over with the basic subshell, the S subshells, the simplest. Uh, and it can, own, it can have one, it has one orbital in the S subshell. Uh, we'll talk about the shapes of them here and see that, that it is like a spherical shape. It is kind of the orientation of it around the nucleus. Uh, and if it's got one orbital, again, that's one pair, that would be 
two electrons total. Now the P subshell has a different orientation and the structure that it kind of takes is as we think around the nucleus we can have something in this area. We talk about probability and then we can have something in this area on the opposite side of it. So that would be one orbital. We can have another orbital that uh, it's kind of hard for me to draw a little bit of perspective here but we have three axes uh, of, of orientation and so as we think of that orientation like this there's uh, going to be uh, a total of three orbitals in there. So if there's three orbitals that means that there's six electrons that can fit into that subshell. The D subshell is bigger again, they keep getting bigger. Um, the D subshell can have five orbitals which uh, means that it can have a maximum of 10 electrons. Now you might be noticing a pattern how many orbitals do you think the F subshell can have? That's right, seven. So we see a pattern there by odd numbers as we're going down, and that means uh, that it would have 14 electrons. So eventually, when we find that other subshell, it's going to have nine orbitals, which should be 18 electrons. And so uh, as we look at the, the periodic table, we can see the structure of the periodic table mirrors this electron distribution and where the subshells are. So with uh, our, I'm cutting it off a little bit here, but as we think about helium, let's whoo, slide down to the bottom. Maybe I'll slide over, wrong direction. <laughs> I'll slide over to the side there. And if we think of helium being up here, like that, instead of over here, uh, we think of helium um, on this side. This blocky section here, and hello, <laughs> I want thicker and I want to get rid of it too. Oh my gosh. There we go. Okay, sorry. I got medium line and I wanted to get a different color. So, with this now, as we think of this section over here, this is the S subshell, this block. And look, it's made of two elements there, right? Just like we talked about the two electrons being in the S subshell. Over here, we have a nice block that is six wide. And this is the P subshell. Those three orbitals make up six electrons as we go across the P subshell. Down here we have a nice block that is 10 wide and this is the D subshell. Oh, oh, Excuse me! <laughs> so uh, down here we see a nice block behind me and everything but this block is 14 wide and this is the F subshell block. So when we think about the periodic table we see all this blockiness of it. It's explained by how the uh, electrons are distributed in these different subshells. So as we start to look at uh, the, the uh, filling up to a certain location, uh, if I was to go to, let me change my color, um, to for sure. If I was going to go to aluminum, well, I would start off in the first shell in the S subshell here, and it would fill up with two. So I would say in the first shell, I'm in the S subshell, and I put two electrons in there. So this is shell, subshell, electrons. So shell, 
here, subshell there, and then electrons. There. So uh, as I'm uh, setting this up here, let me clean this up a little bit. So as I continue on, so I filled the first shell. So now I'm going into the second shell. I'm filling up to aluminum, so I'm in the second shell now. And uh, I'm in the S subshell again, and I'm going to fill that up with two. And now I'm continuing on, but I'm still in the second shell. Uh, and I'm in the P subshell right now. And I fill this up with six electrons. Now I'm forced to come down here into the third shell and again I'm starting over every time each shell always starts with an S subshell and it goes through that same progression each time. So I'm in the third shell now, I'm in the S subshell and I filled that with two and now I'm coming over here I'm still in the third shell, I'm in the P subshell but I'm just coming right to there and I only have one electron in that. So this is how we're going to talk about the, the um, orbital uh, uh, configuration for an element and it will give us more definition about what's going on with the element by looking at how the electrons are spread through the different subshells. So, uh, as we look at our uh, number of subshells, uh, here's a quick little tip for you. If you can remember, the number of subshells is equal to the shell number. And that sounds a little confusing to people at first, but if you think about the third shell, the third shell has three subshells. Right? The fourth shell has four subshells, right? So when we think about that third shell, it's going to it always starts with an S and then it goes in that same progression, P and then a D, like that. So the the first shell only has one subshell, it only has an S, so it only has two. The second shell has uh, two subshells. It has an S and a P. The S only has two. The P has six. So that's a total of eight in the second shell. Now the third shell really is bigger. Freshman year I talked about we just did the first 20. We did 2882 for how the electrons were distributed in the shells. But we know more now, so uh, we're going to do the, be able to do any element that we're uh, looking at on the periodic table. So the third shell has three subshells. It has the S with two electrons maximum. It has a P with a maximum of six. And it has a D with a maximum of 10. So the third shell actually has 18 electrons in it, which makes sense. The first shell only has two. It's the smallest. The second shell has eight. It's bigger than that first shell that it was it's encompassing that. The third shell is bigger yet, and it is bigger. It, it gets up to 18. So they do keep getting bigger, but it gets a little weird because they do overlap each other also. So that's something uh, we're going to talk about here. So uh, got a web page I want to look at. And yeah, let's do this one. So, when we look at this orientation, and I like this animation because it gives us an idea of the, the energies in these uh, orbital configurations. So starting off with, uh, in, in the symbolization, we use the arrows to symbolize electrons of their spin. So this one has a spin going in the up, in the up orientation we would talk about, and then in the as we fill that, we'll have one that's going to go down in the other. So we'll have another arrow going in the downward direction for helium. But you notice what happens when I go from hydrogen to helium. It gets pulled down. 
And the reason is, what we're thinking about here with this idea, is that down here, this is, this is where the nucleus is. So these are being pulled down here. So when we just had one uh, proton, uh, there wasn't as much pull. But now for helium, it's got two protons, it's got more pull, and it's going to pull those in a little bit tighter. Now you also look at the energies. Hydrogen, it takes... Um, there we go. Hydrogen, it takes uh, 1,313 kilojoules per mole. And we'll talk about moles here a little bit. But this amount of energy to rip this electron off. As I go into helium, look how it went up. Because it, we got more protons, it takes more energy to remove these electrons. So as we jump into lithium, we got more protons again. We see this 1s getting pulled down even tighter. But look at the, the 2s. This one electron is pushed out to this new level. When you think about these other electrons down here zipping around the nucleus, they are repelling this one electron here to a new level. So it's pushed further out. So look at the energy to remove that. 526 kilojoules. That's hardly anything, right? So that's super easy for, for some other element to eventually rip this electron off. Now, one downside with this animation is we start to lose some things. Really, that uh, is down here with our orientation like that. You know, it's just being pulled down even lower out of the screen. And so that's what they're doing. So it's not like it's gone. It's still down there. It's just way down there. We can see the energy on it. It's way high now, 12,000 kilojoules. And, you know, it's, it's a bit higher for, for this one because we've added more protons. And as we go to boron, whoops, as we go to boron, we see... Now we're starting to get into that P section, the P block on the periodic table. And we're only one electron in there. Now, as I go to carbon, you might want to think that you're going to draw this other electron in here like this. But I always describe this as like, you know, uh, kids getting on the bus. If there's five of you getting on the bus, you know, you're, you're not going to all you know double up and stuff like that. You're going to be like, get away from me. i got my own seat. And the electrons do that too because they repel each other. So when we go to carbon, we again see it getting pulled down tighter, but we see the electrons spread out. They don't double up until they're forced to, just like you guys on the bus. So now oxygen, we've got to add another uh, electron in there and uh, double up those orbitals. And we get to neon, and man, that's a nice configuration there. It's got this nice completed shell. Uh, the 1s way down there we can't see, but for the second shell we see it's nicely completed uh, with uh, this total of eight electrons. Two in the s and six in the p. Now when we go to sodium, we're going to have to bump an electron out to a brand new level. And again, we're going to, uh, well, we still see our 2s there. And look at the, the 3s with sodium, 373 kilojoules. That's super weak, right? And that's why sodium blew up in water, is because oxygen just grabbed this one electron super easy. The rest of it, this stuff's not coming off, right? You think of the second, uh, the 2p, 3,991. Well, look at neons. 2p. It's only 2,206. Well, neon's super stable. It's not going to lose electrons to oxygen or whatever. So sodium would lose that one, the 3s, but everything else is held in stronger than it was for neon, so nothing else is going to come out. So as we progress through, again, we see stuff dropping off the screen, but they're really there. And then we get to aluminum, so now we're in the, the 3p1, and 3p2, 3p3, 3p4, 3p5, 3p6, and we fill that up. Now this animation again is limited to just these uh, 18. Uh, I wish it would go further, so uh, we'll have to add that in ourselves. But keep in mind this idea of how the energy levels change with the number of protons. Again, that's why the number of protons 
controls what element it is is because we see this progression happen as there's more protons, there's more pull to the nucleus. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. Now, as we have the absorption emission of energy for the electrons uh, in, in, in the atoms, and I've got another animation I want to show you for this. This is just for hydrogen, as you see here in the name. Uh, and we have a certain amount of energies that we can give to this atom. And uh, here's our different quantums of energy. So if I give it the smallest quantum of energy, it's going to absorb that energy and it's going to get pushed out to a new level. Just like adding energy and lifting something against gravity, uh, it has more potential to fall back down. Now, this electron will eventually fall back down. might take too long for, oh, there it happened. And when it did, it gave off some light. It gave off energy. And the amount of energy that it gave off was specific to this jump that it was making. This spacing between these shells is equivalent to that amount of energy. And each one of these shells gives off a different amount of energy because they have a different um, spacing between them. So as we think about uh, giving it some more energy, if I gave it the next bump of energy, it's going to absorb that energy and we see it up at a higher state. Now we have choices. It could fall all the way back down to the, the first energy level. That's the three to one jump and boom. It gives off that amount of energy. Well, it could have also jumped from the third to the second and give off a different amount of energy. And then from the second to the first is that same amount of energy we saw before. So we look at all the possibilities here that we have this up in the fifth shell and it's uh, dropping. It can drop from the fifth to the fourth. Uh, it could drop from the fifth to the third and give off a different amount of energy. It could drop from the fifth all the way down to the first, right? We got all these options of different amounts of energies that they can, or would be released when they fall down. Now, uh, so when electrons uh, uh, go up in an energy level, they must be absorbing energy. And for them to go down, they must emit some energy. And that energy is determined by the spacing between their shells. So for hydrogen, this is what it is, the, what we're seeing here. Now, if I was talking about a different element, what if I had helium? Well, what would be different? If I had uh, another proton in here, well, that would change the pull on the nucleus, right? And that would uh, give us a different levels, right? These, this shell might be here. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. And this shell might be there. <laughs> oh, this is bad. But you get the idea, right? It is that the, the different uh, amount of protons will change the spacing between the shells. And so that's going to change the amount of energy that they give off. So each element has a unique spectrum that it's going to emit. And we'll see those in class. And the, the reason why they have a different spectrum is each element has a different number of protons, which causes different spacing between the shells. So less protons, not as much uh, um, pull towards the nucleus, and we have different spacing than something with more protons, and would have different amounts of energy to move between those shells. So that's the key to understanding the spectrums of the elements. Now, let's go back to our PowerPoint again. One thing that, like I said, we couldn't see in the, that one animation, it only went up to 18, the argon. So when we think about these and when we start to see, uh, actually, I want to go back for a second. 
to the periodic table. When we talked about here, and you know, we had the first shelf, second shelf, third shelf, fourth shelf. So if I have something uh, like gallium, let's say, well, I'm going to start off in the first shell. Again, we think of helium being over here. And in the first shell, I'm in the S subshell, and I would have two electrons. In the second shell, uh, again, filling that up, second shell, two electrons. I come over here and move myself whoa, uh, down, and I'm in the second shell still in the P subshell, and I fill that up with six. Now I come to the third shell, and I'm in the S subshell, and I fill that with two. I come over here, I'm in the third shell, I'm in the P subshell, I fill that with a six, and now I come down here, and I'm in the fourth shell. And I fill that with two. It's <laughs> on the wrong direction. Uh, uh, <laughs> so in the fourth shell, I'm in the S subshell, and I'm filling that with two. But now the third shell has three subshells. It has the D subshell also. This is not part of the fourth shell. This is part of our overlapping. The 4S here comes before the 3D. This is the 3D, this whole block here. So this is where things start getting weird, is because the 4S comes in front of the uh, 3D. Do this. Sorry, Dane, I had to turn off the, the heater. The thermostat was set too high and uh, had to adjust that. So, uh, as I was finishing talking about uh, the gallium's uh, orbital configuration here, this is where things get weird is that that 3D overlaps in front of the 4S. And so now to get to gallium, where are we now? Well, we are in the fourth shell in the P section, and we only have one there. So this is where things start getting weird. The 4S comes in front of the 3D. And then as we get down below and we start getting into the F, and you think, well, which um, shell starts to have an F subshell? Well, the F subshell is the fourth subshell, the fourth shell has four subshells, S, P, D, and F. So way down here, this is actually the 4F down here. This would be the 5F down here. Because remember, if you think of inserting this into this section here, that's where this whole block goes. So as we have the 5S here, 6S, the 6S comes not only in front of the 5D, but the 6S also comes in front of the 4F. So it gets a little weird, but as you start working through this, you know, it, it, you see the pattern and things will be easier for that. Okay, so getting back to where I was here. Move up there. So as we see the Here's our second shell. Here's our third shell. Here's our fourth shell. Right? And uh, as we think about uh, what they each have, but then the overlapping is the weird part here, right? Now, you might be thinking, well, why the heck is, is the 3D actually part of the third shell? Why is not this 4S really part of the three, third shell if it's filling this way first? Well, the thing you've got to remember, realize is that that D subshell is, well, I showed you pictures of it, um, and as, as we look at the crazy orientations that it has, um, it takes a lot of protons to force them into those weird configurations. 
when it first starts filling up, it kind of takes the easy way out, and it doesn't make those real complicated structures until it's forced to. So, as we, but they do eventually get into a nice tight shell. At first, I, I like to show it like this with, uh, where's my camera angle? This way. And uh, the, the third shell has three subshells, and the, <laughs> it's all backwards for me. The fourth shell has four subshells. So as we think of it doing this, but the 4S overlaps in front of the 3D. But what eventually happens is that as we start getting more protons in there, they do get packed in tighter and we do make uh, the actual shells like this. And so we can see here with my cool little animation, my awesome PowerPoint skills, maybe, I pull in. So as we see this, eventually, as just like we saw before in that anime, uh, that uh, website that showed them getting pulled down, they do eventually get pulled down into tight shells, and we do see a basic energy level happen with these. But as they're filling up, they fill up out of order, uh, and and that's the the weird part. So uh, it's a little strange, but uh, you, you need some practice at it. So get on that homework assignment and start practicing.